Hello everyone, my name is Anu Bhatia and I'm, uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of Navigence. Uh, we are an AI SaaS software company and uh, we are developing apps uh, using machine learning and natural language processing. So let me start a little bit about what is AI. I've always, I've worked with GE for nearly two decades. I've been uh, with them in different countries, running different businesses for them. Uh, but uh, I've always worked at the interaction of, uh, I would say, business technology and innovation. And uh, what I can say is that I have not seen any other technology that has delivered, that has the potential to deliver productivity to the extent that AI does and will. So we started way back in 2017 when we first started investing in Navigens. But prior to that, we were being guided by some of the leading data scientists who came from MIT, Carnegie Mellon, George Mason, as well as you Albany over here. We are based in Albany, New York. And uh, one of the reputed data scientists was by the name of uh, Professor Oslam Usener, who had been mandated by President Obama to help reduce the healthcare cost. And the way she used technology was that uh, she took doctor's notes and she was able to extract content from doctor's notes, structure them in form of an Excel or a tabulated uh, uh, form, which then could run statistics to find the most productive route from cure to symptom. And that was the first ever known study in the US where unstructured data, textual data could be structured in order to do statistical analysis. So Dr. Oslam Uzener was also kind of instrumental in setting us up. And naturally we started with the extractive AI, which is basically bringing unstructured text to a lot of statistical analysis. And the way we used it from a business perspective was on how do we extract out the key insights that we would be reading otherwise if we didn't have technology to get to know what massive amounts of data could contain. So that's where extractive AI is used. And naturally when uh, uh, chat GPT was introduced uh, about, I would say 18 months ago, we came to know about Gen AI and the difference between extractive AI is extractive AI gives you the details, whereas Gen AI is mostly, again, using a lot of statistics, but it is trying to predict the next word that you would be using uh, as you write an essay or as you as you create a write up for the for the details that you have dug out. So both together is a very powerful combination. And the way we've positioned our business is that we've got what we call as uh, pre-trained modules. Uh, these are like, uh, you know, these are like uh, models which we sh show to the clients and these help them to propel their own development. We use those pre-trained models that we've developed out of our own proprietary capabilities. We use them for our own products that we develop as subscription-based products. We also develop subscription-based products for our customers. And the last part, which is the third tier of our revenue uh, earning capabilities is the IT services. We do have very premium, uh, premium data scientist and uh, technology team. Uh, some of our members of our team have also developed uh, financial transactional uh, platforms of Western Union. So from that perspective, we've got a very matured and a very experienced team to support advanced AI applications. If I go to the next slide, I'm just going to take a little step back and talk a little bit about AI. Uh, AI, a lot of people ask me whether AI is like .com, is it a hype? Uh, well, uh, all I can say is hard money is going into it and hard returns, hard um, returns measured in uh, tangible money is also being uh, noticed in the market. 
uh, most of uh, the returns that you are seeing is in the hardware sector. NVIDIA is one of them. Uh, but you also see that there are many other companies who are developing the SaaS app like Jasper, Copy AI, which have also taken a large amount of money. And, uh, you know, overall, AI, if you go into the next slide, why is AI so important for us? Uh, there's a lot of hype on whether AI will make our jobs redundant. I think to that extent, uh, whenever technology is introduced, there is there are changes that, that happen in the workflows. But overall, uh, UN has already declared that the number of babies that are being born in the world, it had its peak in 2019. So from 2020, the number of babies are declining. Every country is facing a problem of how do we replenish the labor. And uh, naturally, AI, with its promise of productivity, is actually going to help us to maintain our GDP growth uh, or at least uh, restrict the fall of any GDP growth because GDP is always linked to human, uh, human population to a certain extent. Uh, without AI, it would be very difficult to manage all our processes and the way that we have organize the, uh, the work environment so far. I'll go back again to where I started as to how do we earn revenue. Uh, we've got a toolkit, which are, which are our pre-trained models. These are also available directly on the web. You can always go into pluaris.com, which is extractive AI, and lily.ai, which is our gen AI. Uh, these are there when we demo to different customers. Uh, we develop custom built apps. These are mostly customer funded. So we're going to be talking, we're going to be showcasing the one that we developed uh, for Guppy, which is on an interactive creative storytelling, how it used extractive AI uh, in order to build the app. We're also going to be talking about our own apps, which is researchwork.ai. This is something which uh, MySci has used and MySci team is here today with us. They are our customers. They're the ones who actually uh, opened out their archives in order to for us to kind of extract content for an exhibition that they ran, which was uh, Ground to Gourmet on food. Uh, the same thing we are doing with Brandis.ai. And Brandis.ai is again picking up on some of the pre-trained models that we have. But this is uh, going towards online digital media. I think a lot of companies like uh, even us, uh, we struggle to get uh, an online presence, an online brand. And this uh, Brandis.ai evaluates our options, helps us to predict from a cost perspective as to which, or which direction we should go in order to promote ourselves, and then tracks our performance also uh, in terms of whether we are getting the returns from our marketing budget or not. So, uh, you, so basically we develop our own products. We develop customer funded, the customer funded programs that we work for also uh, select branders in order to promote themselves. And the last part of our services is that uh, we do have a team that uh, helps to uh, box all these products together. Uh, range of our customers, they have some global Fortune 500, Equinix is one of them. Uh, we've got Equinix, which is one of the largest data center provider. Uh, you've got the Container Cube. Uh, we've got MySci, uh, which is a museum uh, to which we took the application, Guppy Theater. We've got Owens Corning, who's tried it from, uh, who's tried the extractive AI in terms of uh, all the purchasing contracts that they wanted us to kind of assimilate and, and make sure that they're all complete. Uh, so we've got different, uh, I would say, companies from uh, small, medium, and large corporations who are our client. And uh, if we go to the next slide, what are our customers saying about us? My size says that uh, it helped to kind of discover connections uh, in their archives. Uh, huge tomes of books which were uploaded in the product and our product was within about two to three days able to extract out very rich content and show them the connections uh, on food, nutrients, uh, the kind of health benefits that foods have, uh, where exactly did they originate from. So we brought all those connections, Guppy Theater 
is about uh, uh, providing a family entertainment program on how children can create stories by extracting little, little pieces from different stories. I'll come back to it later. And of course, we've got uh, uh, a company which is Tech Mahindra, a kind of a service company, which also used uh, the product in order to uh, in order to educate the salespeople uh, to shorten the prospecting time. So if we go to the market opportunity that we are talking about, or even if we take our own product, which is branders.ai in terms of online uh, branding uh, improvements that we want to do, that's close to about uh, close to about six hundred and seventy million dollars when you take into the influencer marketing as well as the uh, the the total advertising market that we have. The influencer market is the one which is growing a lot, and uh, naturally we also are promoting ourselves. And at this, uh, you know, we are promoting ourselves by selecting some of the influencers who are most predominant in our field and, uh, you know, asking them to help us promote uh, our products uh, definitely brings a leverage. And you can see that this market is the one which is uh, going to grow uh, to a pretty large extent. It's predicted to go to a pretty large extent. Then you come into the B2B segment where most companies are trying to look at AI to solve some of their complex business problems. And we pick and choose those problems which are first complex and two, which use both extractive as well as generative AI in order to do uh, the work. And we, of course, like to also combine branders with those products in order to promote them. So we do take the distribution rights also for the programs that we are developing for our customer, which is essentially what we are doing for Guppy also. So coming into what's our needs currently, we brought the business up to this level, mostly through a private placement funding, which has been close to about, I would say a little over $6 million. And yes, we are looking to do an S1 filing for a mandatory reporting. This should be completed by July. Uh, we do need to hire some additional uh, key resources. We are looking for a capital infusion. Uh, in order to kind of build up products a little faster than where we are currently, as well as uh, promote ourselves aggressively from a product as well as from an investor relation perspective. Uh, we do have, uh, we, we are seeing a good quarter on quarter growth. I think uh, by the time that we end April, early May, uh, our story is about uh, quarter on quarter growth and what do we see for the th uh, for the third quarter will also be coming through in the press. Uh, the attractiveness for investors. So if you look into the total tradable stock that we have, that's a little over 42 million uh, with about 20 million in free float. Uh, most of our shareholders invested in the private placement with the long-term view in mind. There is not so much of supply of stock, which is which you can see from the last 14, 15 months of the track records that we have, having listed with the OTCQB uh, exchange. And uh, there is a class B share, which predominantly I own, and they are not tradable. Uh, so overall, we are talking about not more than about a 20 million float. Uh, from a point of view of our own public presence, this is the first uh, conference that we are attending. Uh, we have maintained a very low key uh, public presence. And uh, now that uh, we are seeing growth, we are seeing uh, uh, revenues coming in from the customers. Uh, naturally, we are going to amp up our public presence. Uh, we've got a strong growth strategy with AI SaaS products. Uh, we are, you know, uh, Amazon never invented the internet, but it used the internet to become the company that it is today. It's the same which goes for refrigeration. Refrigeration was invented but the company that used refrigeration in order to, to sell a lot was Coca-Cola. So we also look at AI and we are saying they're not fundamental in any material and any machine learning or NLP model, but we have been able to apply them very well 
for what we have developed so far and uh, they are all on a basis of pre-trained models which can actually propel development uh, propel the speed of development very quickly so coming to the next slide we are seeking funds we are seeking about two million dollars we are in discussions with a few uh, companies to help us this is not immediate but this would be in phases uh, we uh, we do want to increase uh, our spending especially on the marketing side now uh, which is where we see us a little different from the rest of the people who've got funded uh, they invest a lot on the marketing side uh, from a five-year projection uh, we were relatively very small in revenue as we came out uh, from COVID uh, last year, uh, we were able to increase our revenue. This is our uh, year to re uh, increase revenue. Of the 1.9 million that you see in 2024, we have already achieved anywhere between 1.1 to 1.4 million in terms of uh, orders that we either got or we are expecting. So it gives us a pretty large confidence that we'll be in the, at least in the range that we predict for 2024. Naturally, the faster we get uh, cash, the better we are able to reach the higher end of the projection uh, for the years that we are projecting in the future. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the strategy at work. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are looking at uh, developing our channels wherever there is history to facts. So when we go into museums, when we go into education, uh, that's the sector uh, which requires history to facts. When we are inside the firewall of the company also, we are looking at uh, ways in which we are able to assimilate knowledge from historical events and convert them into facts, into business decisional uh, mapping for them in order to help them take faster decisions. But to get inside the company, there are advantages that come with our product. The first advantage is that we've got, uh, uh, we've got full traceability of wherever we extract the content from. So from a copyright protection, uh, the consumer is protected. And the second aspect is that we don't use the data of the customer in order to train our machine, which is what chat GPT, uh, which is what a lot of these big names that you're talking about, they use that data in order to train the machine. So we, we offer privacy on top of uh, copyright protection, which is why customers come to us. Uh, the second part of this is also uh, where we are working with uh, uh, from fiction to fantasy, as well as uh, we are looking at uh, uh, facts to fiction, which is the guppy model, which also has a pretty large consumer base of uh, children and families who want to uh, develop some kind of a creative uh, uh, media experience, storytelling experience. So I'm going to hand it over to Kurt now. Uh, Kurt, uh, if you could lead us through these slides. Absolutely. Uh, so as Noop mentioned, my name is Kurt. I am the Vice President of Exhibit Development at MySci, the Museum of Innovation and Science. And we have been undertaking a several years um, project to create traveling museum exhibits to uh, improve our, to not only improve our business status, but also to take the information that we preserve as a museum and use it in a way that not only fulfills our mission through educating the public, but also allows us to find the value within all of our preserved information. So the Ground de Gourmet project involved creating an exhibit that dealt with the various foods that created the cuisine of New York State. And from this, we had a rather large bibliography of research and pieces from our archives that we wanted to create a, a marketable and coherent story from. And in working with Nowagents and through the Polaris system, we were able to determine there were quite a few additional connections within our data that we would not have made ourselves. Now, we are well aware within the museum field that a lot of our research doesn't make it to the vinyl, excuse me, to the final product. And of course, that research, those connections represent value that we wanted to be able to use. And through using the system, 
we were able to look on to what sort of additional possibilities were offered by the data that we had. Previously, we had only conceived of our data in terms of a story of the foods that had gone into the local cuisine. However, our research, uh, when processed through the system, also revealed a coherent story about the categorization of those foods, the stories behind how those foods were developed, and even the connections, the possible connections found between those foods and healthcare. And it's actually led to a few additional business opportunities for us going forward and for the Ground to Gourmet product. The other thing we were able to do is we were able to bring all of this information to our visitors in a way that we would not have been able to do before through our on-floor kiosk model. And this allowed visitors to actually get into our voluminous archives in a way that in previous times we would not be able to. And I have to stress that as a museum, our position of public trust is one of the most important assets that we have. And so the traceability, the uh, fidelity of the information was absolutely paramount to our decision. And in working with Nowagents, we were able to, uh, well, we were impressed to find that we were able to work with them and create a data system where we were not only fully confident in the validity of the information that we were able to put out, but we were also in control of curating and keeping the control that we needed over our information in order to make the highest quality product and to keep within our mission and business plan. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back to Anoop. Right. So this is just another application. Uh, we talked about the museum application, which, you know, is fact to history to facts. This is about fiction. So in this particular application, the customers uploaded some of the most famous of uh, the fairy tales that uh, we all read when we were growing up. And uh, the way the app works is that, uh, you know, you can choose the story world and each of them has their own story. But uh, essentially, uh, when we are looking at uh, the way we've trained our modules, we've always trained it based on a process because most of the discussions that we have are around seven W's, who, what, where, whether you're in business or uh, you're having a personal discussion, whenever you're trying to uh, structure the unstructured text, you're always asking questions about who, what, where, uh, why, when, how, how much. So we include the how and how much also. That's the same foundation on which this story world was being created where the child can select who the primary uh, characters are in the, if the child selects a little girl for instance then naturally stories like Alice in Wonderland, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, Red Riding Wolf, uh, all those stories come up because they have a little girl and when the red color is being connected very similar to what my side did with food immediately you know the red uh, apple that the the grandmother showed snow white is connected to red riding hood ideas are extracted and the child kinds of use those extracted ideas to create a completely new story within illustration and that piece becomes their own copyright that's their own story so this is again how extractive ai is playing a role into how the world is kind of shaping up for us. You can create a situation, you can select, the child has all the ingredients and the child can then share it. So I think, uh, and then I think at the last part of the story is that you do have images which are in two dimensions. They are looking at images also in the third dimension, which will take a year or two to happen, uh, but definitely uh, the world is moving in this aspect of uh, fiction to fantasy, or facts to fiction, creating a better learning experience for the child. So I think I come to the last slide and then I have a few questions here which have been asked. So we've got a pretty good team, uh, very reputable uh, people from MIT as well as, uh, you know, from uh, University of California. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got, uh, 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 we, we've got good business executives who are guiding us as we work through uh, AI, which is an emerging tech. I think nobody knows, uh, nobody has the playbook 
completely read. And we also learn and we adapt. Thank you so much for your time. I have a few questions which have been asked. So I'm going to, I have a problem reading them. Can you discuss how Walmart and, a, and AAA are utilizing your so software? So Walmart and AAA came through an acquisition that we made last year uh, with an IT services company. And that's the one which has uh, very good data scientists, team architects, uh, have developed enterprise level applications, uh, including the Western Union one that I mentioned to you. Uh, so they have, they are mostly working on an SOW, providing some of these uh, uh, solution architects as well as data scientists to, uh, to Walmart and AAA. Uh, those are products which we are developing for them. And, uh, uh, you know, those are not the ones that we would market. Another question was asked that you are focused on very large markets. Can you speak of your sales and marketing channels and how you differentiate your offering? So I'll start with the latter part first. How do we differentiate? We provide full traceability in terms of Gen AI, which is where, where people are mostly focused on. Uh, Gen AI suffers from the lack of traceability from where the data is coming from. Uh, a lot of imagination because an essay can always be uh, written without uh, going into too much facts. And also the data privacy issue. Until we do not solve the data privacy issue, you cannot go B2B and you can't uh, ask the businesses to share your share their data to be intermingled with, say, the public uh, external triggers so in our case we are very we have a differentiated products we are able to penetrate into the enterprises we do have data security uh, privacy as well as uh, uh, traceability uh, completely intact uh, we when we started developing the product uh, we wanted it to be a generic product we didn't want it to focus on one single domain which is why we have a process, which is the process of seven W's, et cetera, which helps us to go to get sector agnostic. So yes, we are addressing a very big market, but we are also channelizing ourselves through researchers, historians, uh, museum curators, and educators who are involved with this entire field of taking factual research into, into to their consumers. Their, their credibility is at stake and our credibility is at stake. And this is a pretty large market even in the US because there are 50 million visitors going into museums. And uh, even if you look at the educators and you look at the children who could be also using the Guppy app uh, for creative storytelling, we are looking at a market of about 75 to 80 million users. So we are channelizing ourselves, that's our focus. And that's uh, the focus for us to get into B2B also. And the last question which was asked, I think there are a few more, but uh, the last question that time would allow us is what is your revenue model and the revenue size of a typical sales installation? So our revenue model we talked about, uh, we basically custom develop apps for our customers, which we use to also promote them uh, through branders.ai. And uh, our typical revenue size is anywhere between, uh, say about uh, like the one that we are bidding now, our volumes are increasing. The one that uh, we are getting into a mining project is a million dollars. But previously our, our revenue size was mostly from about 50 to $90,000 per app. So uh, we are seeing an increase in the revenue per customer.